I have a finger pointing at me with great enthusiasm, which says that I'm probably live and on camera. So I will uh, wait the normal prerequisite amount for someone to say that they can hear me loud and clear. And then once I, uh, I get that heads up, then uh, we will go ahead and get started. This is my favorite part. The, the Oh, there you go. Someone says they hear me. So awesome. Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, Dev Stream number seven uh, for Expeditions Rome. We're excited to have you all here. Um, I have my friend Hans with me today. Hey, Hans, how you doing? Hey, Brad. I'm doing pretty good. How about yourself? You know, Hans, I am hanging in there. We were talking about this during the, the early prep, and, and people probably hear it in my voice. Um, and I guess those who joined the, the Knights of Honor stream probably heard it in my last one, too. I'm still sick, which is insane. Um, so if I, if I cough or have any kind of uh, uh, moments of, of raspiness, um, it's because my, I've been coughing and hacking for a couple weeks now it's not COVID. it's just a head cold but it is it has lingered for now going on two weeks straight so um i really like for it to go away but aside from that i'm doing all right how have you been yeah i'm good it's, uh, it's been a, a long time since i was last on the stream and uh now we're back to, to dive a bit deeper into some of the uh the fun stuff that i've been cooking up for you in the, in the game but, um i feel like the dev diary was a is a bit of a tough one to get through because it's a lot of design as we talked about how it's almost like reading up a, a game manual but you don't have like all the cards and the things to attach it up to it just becomes like a lot of text and putting the puzzles together yourself um so that's why we're, we're here on the stream now to, to talk about it a bit more freely and open form yeah, and conversation right excellent yeah the um uh i think it was dev stream number three that you were on the first time maybe two or three so it has been a while definitely yeah we on it was like back in july yeah. or something yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Well, um, go ahead. Sorry. No, it's all dark and rainy right now. Whereas, like back in July, it was sun was shining. It was, it was great. You're sick now, but uh, like we 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 keep going, right? We need to make the game. Keep the streams up. Yeah, definitely. Well, um, we have a, a a lot of good stuff to talk about today. Um, it was a like like you kind of alluded to. Um, it was a very thick uh dev diary this time around. There's a lot to talk about. And uh, I think I even saw one of the questions on the uh, the community site was about how it's, oh, this is a little bit confusing. So hopefully we'll mm -hmm. be able to, 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 to clear up some of that confusion during the stream. And um, if you haven't read it, the, the diary is available for you all to read at um, community.expositionsseries.com. It's below me today, or at least right now. So you can see the link down there underneath Hans. Um, we'd love to have you come and plug into our community and join. And also for those who don't know, uh, we have a very special event taking place on Friday for THQ Nordic as a whole. We have our, our, our THQ Nordic uh, 10th anniversary uh, event taking place. So on this channel, we'll have a lot of really cool stuff to show off. Uh, there may be a, uh, a new uh, Expeditions Rome uh, video on there. Um, so tune in for that um, on, on Friday and you guys can see news about all the different stuff going on at THQ Nordic and celebrating our 10th anniversary. And I hopefully um, a number of you will tune in and have a lot of fun with that. It should be uh, hopefully all over uh, Twitch on that day. So it should be an exciting event for everybody. Well, we're talking about uh, progression today and experience and character leveling and items, all that kind of good stuff. This is like the core of an RPG. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's it's all the stuff that you expect to be there, like uh, with the, the expedition series having its stems and inspiration from, from Dungeons & Dragons being a board game, referring back to that as well, having XP and level and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, we're, yeah, we're going to talk about how, how we approach those things in, in Rome and make sure that you feel like you're going to grow in power and have a proper RPG experience. Sir, are you a D&D &D player? No, I am not. I, I think I've played a couple different sessions of D&D uh, &D and I have a really hard time balancing myself between like just doing the gameplay and then doing the, the whole narrative part and, and getting myself into my character. Um, I think it's fun, but it, maybe it's about having that proper group and uh, balancing with the, the players that you're you're playing with, right? But no, I'm not like an, an avid player at all. I know the game. Uh, we talk a lot about it in the office, but no. I I think I'm more maybe Warhammer's or Hero Quest. Uh, okay, okay. I'd be curious how many D&D players we have in the chat today. I know that uh, a lot of fans of these types of games really are into those, uh, you know, pen and paper old school role-playing games i played a lot when i was a kid different i didn't play a lot of actual dungeon and dragons but i played a lot of role-playing games like verbal pen and paper role-playing games when i was a kid oh, really? um huge i was a huge biotech fan for a while um i had a lot of the fossa biotech manuals and uh um love that stuff so uh yeah quite a bit 
Um, well, I think uh, a good place for us to start is talking about some of those core um, uh, aspects. And a lot of this is going to be basic, but still, I think there's some uniquenesses to how we do yeah. it in Rome that may be worth going through. So, of course, the, the, the kind of center of everything is experience that you gain. Um, and I guess um, you gain experience, I guess, not, I wouldn't say differently than a lot of other games, but there is some special um, like nuances to how experience works in Rome. So um, how do you gain experience for doing things? How does the experience system work at its core? Well, in Expedition in Rome, you gain XP from completing quests. And I think what stands out there from a lot of other games is that the content that you do from doing the, those games, like, or like the actual objectives that you have, those don't give like subpars of XP. You don't get XP from killing wolves or digging out ore or anything like that. Like you need to go and deal with something which you either sort out to do yourself or which you would request to do for, for Rome. Uh, and then that grants you XP. Yeah, I think that's a really uh, interesting um, uh approach you know obviously we've all played um and i'm not gonna talk negative about them because sometimes the the grind can actually be kind of fun i i, I am i've definitely grinded in a few of the, the rpgs i've played and enjoyed it uh, at time but you know the games where you have like you get experience per battle and you have to kind of use that to level up um you know our uh our, our approach is very different in the sense that you're really getting experience for progression and i, I think um one of the ways we talked about this is the game is story centric in a sense that this, the narrative is a big part of it. So for us, it made sense to kind of reward that uh, story progression as part of how you grow as a uh, grow your characters. Definitely. I mean, even though we're an RPG and a lot of RPGs can be freeform, Rome is very story-centric. And uh, the story gives you like ups and downs throughout your life. And we kind of wanted like you growing as a person also to reflect a little into to the experience. So that meant that we needed to, to be able to control the amount of experience you had through the story. So we have some sheets calculating out like what is the minimum amount of level you can actually be at certain points if you if you don't complete a certain amount of like side quests or um you know, think a bit a bit more into some other ways that you can kind of not gain xp or gain more xp uh, but essentially like that's a that's a max level that's possible at every time throughout the entire game and also a minimum level so we make sure that you don't fall too far behind or get too far ahead right i think that that's that's a, that's a good uh, segue into the next talking point which is you know, there's a, you have your party that you can travel with, and you can change that party, I guess, when you go into different uh, locations. But we do have um, uh, ways, I guess experience kind of falls into a couple of different classifications because you have like the, the, the full experience you get from your party, but mm -hmm. uh, I guess you also, everyone else that you have, all your other recruited Praetorians or people that aren't participating, they also get experience as well as you're completing quest and whatnot, correct? Yes, so since we have these uh, companion characters with, uh, which Jonas talked about a lot that are very centric to the story, they need to be in certain scenes, and therefore that means that they also, no matter what, will partake in, in more fights than your other hired Praetorians will. And um, to alleviate a bit from that, and you just not using those characters all the time, there are also certain fights where you can only bring one of such characters, and then the other characters that you bring will have to be Praetorians. And what we wanted to do there is to, instead of having all characters be level 12, even though that would be simple, it felt, felt like it was an easy place to put in more choice to favorize some characters. Like if you want your archers to be stronger than your your um, your princeps with uh, with the shield, then you would bring those into battle and, and they would get uh, rewarded accordingly. And how that works is so that the, the characters that you bring into to a, a quest that also has a fight in them, they will be rewarded with a full experience from from that fight and then everyone else will get half the amount and that way yeah, we kind I of mean, make sure that no one falls too much far behind right yeah i think it's a, a good blend because you have i mean obviously the people that are actually there and you want to um you know hopefully inspire players to experiment with different parties and you know uh you know try different things but at the same time um you know uh you know it makes it a little bit easier to have that catch up for the people that you're not Necessarily using as frequently, and I think that that's yeah. it's a it's a you know there's like you mentioned before like you mentioned there's there are some uh, experiences that you can only play like I, I know me personally I favor the companions because I think the companions are really cool and they have a lot of personality and I just think that's fun, um, but you can't just rely on your companions you have to like have your other Praetorians that you level up and and, and have experiences with too and and uh, there are some missions that kind of require them so there's a balancing act there between the different uh, people that you bring to different quests. Definitely. We did want you to like. I think some players will really like that they're not forced into uh, like the companions too much. Some players really like the freedom, and they might name all of their Praetorians yeah, based on like their own 
the characters you could have uh, Bradius and Hansus alongside in the party and you want to make sure they're like performing really well all the time so bring them in and get full XP yeah exactly and I think that's it's 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 um it, it to a certain degree it, it kind of encourages that experimentation because you're not sitting there mm. with one guy that's like level three um or at the same time if they're always all the same level they're getting the same thing it also kind of like take some of that attachment and value out of it. So completely agree with that. So um, there's another thing that we didn't talk about in the diary that I think is worth mentioning, which we've gone through the um, the Legion battle system where mm. certain Praetorians kind of lead your army into those bigger war uh, 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 um, uh, events where you're fighting another army and you have the, uh, we've seen, we've shown some screenshots, I think, uh, of that here and there. And there's a whole different experience um, source for Praetorians that are participating in the Legion battles, which is also cool because if you have guys that you're just using in legion battles and not really using for moment to moment gameplay they also have a way to grow and, and get experience too yeah exactly i mean we want to make sure that that there's also a reason for having the high higher level characters of being in charge of your legions like they're, they're more experienced um and so they should be able to catch up in xp there or fall behind depending on what they're doing and like all of that plays into the entire gameplay loop or the the other meta systems which we talked about in like the stream five i think yeah yeah I, uh, someone just uh, decided to give us um, uh, slanted um, uh, Roman names, Bradius and Hansus, I guess. Mm -hmm. what, it, it's funny about this. So when we first started working on um, Expeditions Rome with the marketing team at THQ Nordic, there were a few email threads where I was like, um, uh, God, I wish I could remember exactly. One of our, our, our marketing uh, uh, people, um, Melanie, uh, she gave me a Roman name, like something... L L Bradius, uh, Bradfordus, Log Logstonius, uh, the whatever, from what it was this whole thing. And for a while, every email, whatever she was talking to me, that's what she would call me. Uh, that went on for like, a good month or so. It was quite entertaining. So I should dig that out and find out exactly what the name yeah, um, like, Dig that uh, out and we'll put it on a character name. Like, we'll, we'll, maybe we'll have a Praetorian Edgeland named that, or maybe just a random guy you can find in, the, in, like, in the game. That could be fun. Some dude hanging out in the Rome streets, right? Actually, uh, and I was also, uh, maybe uh, for next stream, producer Alex in the background, we should have my name be my Roman uh, equivalent <laughs> name instead of Brad Loxton on my on my title card from the future. That would be fun. Um, I would love to hear in chat, like, if other people have their own, like, what is the Roman names that you would want to use um, for your characters? Do you have, like, your own Roman equivalent of your name or your your handle or whatever? It would be fun to see. So, um, back on, on topic. So uh, when you gain experience, obviously you have experience thresholds, then you level up. Um, so mm -hmm. what happens when you level up? Like we, we, we say we're going to like level four or level five. What are the things that change about the character when you level? Well, um, every character gains X amount of health for, uh, for gaining a level. That's the only stat that will increase. And then they get some skill points. And of course, what like the reason why you're gaining something from leveling up and like, you know, growing the numbers is we want the character to feel like they grow in power. Like you... You have that dream of becoming the strongest soldier, the most experienced one, and going from zero, having not a lot of tools, not knowing a lot about the game, then learning about the game and gaining more tools, getting stronger. That's like the whole experience that you want to get. And sometimes you want to fall, feel like you fall behind in power, and sometimes you want to fall up. And uh, we made sure that something we'll dig into later as well is equipment feels much more important in Expeditions Rome. And so we chose that the only stat that you'll gain from leveling up is your health pool growing actually yeah i think that's interesting uh by the way uh for those that may not recognize we are showing new gameplay footage today so for people that are eager to see gameplay footage or if anyone wants to go tell all the discord fans that may be on the fence and haven't joined the stream yet uh we have i think two or three new clips that we're showing today on gameplay uh we have some uh we have some new uh, uh combat encounters that we're showing so those are really fun to watch and then we also have some uh, some new inventory shots and leveling shots. So for those that like the sneak peeks, we don't always um, announce that we're going to be doing new gameplay footage, but there's about uh, 15 or 20 minutes of new footage that we'll be showing throughout the stream. So I hope you guys enjoy that. Yeah, I think it's, a, it, it's, um, it's at first, I think when I heard that we were only increasing health, I was a little bit hesitant on that because the mm -hmm. sense of power growth that most players expect come from um, the stat improvements. But I think it makes sense in a couple different ways. One, I mean... In essence, it's health. It's like more experience. You're sturdier. You're stronger um, to a certain degree. But it also kind of keeps with a fantasy that, like, you know, if you're a level three or level four, and someone's level twenty, um, you know, you're still humans, right? Like this is a this is yeah. a, 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 a almost like a real not reality based game, but it's 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 rooted in reality. So we don't want to like have people run around with superpowers, and it's like all of a sudden I went from like 
strength five to strength 50 and I can't fight someone anymore. So that, it kind of keeps that fantasy alive a little bit, which I, I mm. liked. Um, I thought that was really cool. Um, but it still makes you more survivable and it gives you some more things that you can do with that. So that makes it interesting. Um, yeah. and, but I also think that, um, like we talked about before, the power curve really comes from skills, passive, active skills and whatnot. And a big part of leveling up is getting those those perk points that you can use to put into those different passive and actives on the character side. Um, so I think that's, that's it, 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 it creates some really interesting progression curves for the game that I think is actually quite fun. Yeah, uh, it essentially, like, will we'll give you more more health, which will make you, like, if you're kind of allowed to make more mis mistakes, right? Take more hits, be punished more. Uh, and we do have certain, like, spikes of power throughout the game. Whereas, like, once okay. the enemies, they, they spike in power, then, then, of course, you will suddenly feel weaker in, in balance to them. But if you gain your spike in power before they do, they do then you, you'll find yourself to be much uh, stronger. But only in health. Uh, and that was kind of the thing we wanted to do is that like you just felt more survivable and it didn't feel like it, you became, became superhuman. We didn't want to do that thing. Yeah, you're not Captain America. You're. you're I mean, <laughs> I guess Roman uh, soldiers were kind of the Captain Americas of their day to a certain degree, but still, it's like um, once you've reached that pinnacle of being a soldier, the incremental differences are more in the skill that you have in fight and mm. combat and not that you got like Terry Crews sized muscles all of a sudden and can punch through walls, right? Like it doesn't work that way. Um, which exactly. hopefully everyone got the Terry Crews reference. I'm not sure how many people there uh, uh, are fans of Terry Crews. You should know um, Terry Crews. He's awesome. Right? Terry Crews is great. Um, He's awesome. By the way, CR Fang and uh, um, ACI uh, NC, uh, 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 Sink. I, I'm not sure if I, I pronounced the name right. Uh, great to have you guys and excited that you're excited. It's it's a uh, um, it's a it's a it's a great it's it's a great uh, to see people being excited about the title. So there is you mentioned just health, but there is one. And I know this from, there is one stat that also goes up that's not related to health when you level up that I thought was fun that we dropped into the diary, um, which is, to me, I think it's kind of interesting, but it, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I'm, there's a logical reason for it, I'm imagining. The unarmed stat also goes up when you level up randomly. There's one other stat aside from health. So what's that about? Like, unarmed gets better as you get a uh, higher level? Yeah, essentially how, how it's put into the game is that once you're not equipping any weapons, what we actually do is that you have fist weapons and that is not to say that you put on like a knuckle of iron or anything it's your actual fists which have stats on them like how much damage do you dish out when you just punch you do and right, right. each class of characters then have the different fists that means that the the archer are able to perform certain things in combat that the heavy class is not uh, for example we have one skill which is just called throw something uh which where you just pick up a, like a rock or a, a, a bottle they find or a piece of wood and you throw that and that's to give uh, the the range character a some kind of range capabilities that won't definitely won't perform the same as a bow, but they still kind of fit into that class. And so uh, when you hit certain level thresholds without the game, which are the level thresholds where we also kind of do those uh, stat bombs that I mentioned, you you kind of gain more damage onto your fist. You're now now better at performing attacks with your with your fists, so you and do, you, do you also gain more abilities. Bit. A little bit, a little yeah, bit. you get a little bit buffer, a little bit stronger, right? A little bit better at the at the punchy punch, but but only to the degree where you should still use a sword. I mean, right. well, right, for, yeah. for a bit, you'll use a sword, like yeah, that that's definitely the, the stronger option. And so yeah. I think what's really interesting there, and the hints in, is that not only do you gain bigger Terry Crews muscles as we call, call them now, you also gain new ways of actually uh, using unarmed uh, abilities. So as we talked about briefly in the previous F stream, and we'll talk about more now is that all weapons have skills on them you don't have that one attack to use and so your fists right, right, start right. off with a certain amount of skills and then they kind of grow in the sense that you get more more options of what you can actually do in unarmed combat so that and that way you ensure that unarmed combat doesn't feel the same early in the game as it does late in the game i guess this is a little bit of foreshadowing but i feel like one of the reasons why we have that in there is because there may be some special mm -hmm. moments in the game where uh you may have to use those punchy punches to get through a situation, right? Like you don't always have your weapons on you, maybe. So there is some, there are some like uh, uh, moments in in the game where um, having that improvement to those skills could be useful. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah, I mean, I think one thing we can say for sure is if you're a Roman historian, you would know that the weapons and a legion is not actually allowed within Rome itself. And right, right, right. The player right. goes to Rome from the game. I don't think we, we need to say any more than that. But like there, back then, and what history tells, you were not always allowed to 
to wear weapons, have weapons on you where, where you might need. Right, right, makes sense. Uh, before we move on to the next topic, one thing that I'm I'm surprised no one has asked yet, but I'm gonna go ahead and throw it out there. What is the uh, what is the max level in the game? The max level is level twenty. That's when level like your your muscle is just gonna stop grow. Like that's your pinnacle, and it's it actually doesn't go down from there. You just hit twenty and you stay there. Right, right, right. So let's go into um, let's change topics a little bit. We talked a bit about the core of how the leveling system works. Now let's go into what I think is probably the, um, and obviously you get health and you get other uh, improvements as you go, but the biggest part is really about the skill points and and, and how you can use those skill points to um, uh, go into your character and kind of improve them. So um, the way I understand it, basically you get a skill point uh, for, you know, I, I saw it. I definitely noticed. I noticed my name changed. Bradius Maximus, that's great. I, I actually, I, again, I will I will pull up the exact name that, our wonderful uh, marketing uh, person gave me, and I'll, we'll, we'll have the, the we'll, we can even uh, put quotes around it or something for the next one. It was a whole, like, thing. It was pretty great. It was after our first, like, deep dive into the game back, like, I want to say it was a year ago or so. So I'll, I'll pull it out. So uh, you get skill points for each level, and then you can play them, place them into different skill trees. And I actually think we have, like, a, a picture or an image we can put up that's static that shows just how the skill trees look. So I'll have um, them pull that up there so everyone can kind of see what we're talking about. So tell us about the skill trees. How are these laid out for each of these different characters? And we have we have multiple classes in the game, I should clarify. So there's, I think, um, five classes, if I remember correctly, right? Like there's five different, four classes. Four, okay, four there's four four classes. classes. Um, and then how do the skills work inside of each of those four classes? Well, with four classes and three subclasses or three skill trees in, in every class, we have a total of 12 subclasses. And the goal with this was that all players should feel like they they will find some of like one of the core fantasies that you might find in other RPGs that you can also fit into here. So, for example, we have plenty of skills uh, in one of the subtrees for the heavy class or the princeps, um, that skill tree being called the veteran, and that one is very defensive. It's all about being able to repair your shield, to keep your shield immune from from bad status effects, and to turn that shield into like almost like a shield wall, and that's a core fantasy that players really just want to have this one defensive guy and fill out that role. But for me personally, even though I know a lot of players like that, and I do use it on occasion, it's very useful to have that character in the game. I much more like to go over with my shield and bash someone in the face and have them like fall over or be, be pushed down uh, like the slope so that I can pass by them. And suddenly like that's kind of two different personalities behind the same type of item behind the shield. And we really want to make sure that these subclasses are there to fill out these uh, these player fantasies. And then ideally, the players also sometimes kind of building their own fantasies of mixing the different skill trees with each other. Awesome. So yeah, if we can get the um, I'm gonna ping producer Alex in the background here. If we can put the the skill tree image up there, I think it's a static one. Which skill tree image do we have um, in the dev diary? Do you remember what the class tree was, uh, Hans? In the dev diary, there's a picture of uh, Julia Keller there. Um, who's an archer class, yeah, so uh, archer and she class. specialized okay. in the uh, the hunter skill tree uh, in the dev stream. It's a pretty interesting okay. one. Perfect. Okay, so this is an example on the screen here of how these things work out. So basically, you have the three subclasses, and then for each of them, there's eight different skills. And basically, yeah. as you level up your 20 levels, you're going to get these skill points. And now these 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 are trees in the in a very like traditional RPG sense, right? So you have to get points um, and then kind of level them up as you go like, to get a lower. I should say lower or higher, whichever way you want to think about it. But to get cool. more you go advanced, deeper into the tree. Yeah, you go deeper into the tree um, by putting points into that particular tree. So, like, if you wanted to get all the way to the bottom of those marksmen, you have to put points in the marksman tree. Exactly. I, when you put the one point into the marksman tree, that will unlock row two in the marksman tree, but not row two in the hunter or the sniper tree. And then you'll have to put in, I think it's like three points, and then you can go to row three or it's okay. five points. Like, so it's not just that one point takes you to the next row. You need to, to spend a bit, a bit more. And that's where it gets interesting. Whether you kind of want to make sure to, to go deep into that tree or, or spread out a bit more because there's some useful stuff in most of the trees. And I think most people are gonna be familiar with these types of features. They're, they're very, they're pretty standard. Yeah. Um, so the, uh, and, and, and they, they, um, there's actives and passives. So some skills are passives, which means once you unlock them, they, they, they are always present. And some are active yeah. skills, just like your weapon skills that you can use during combat. Um, mm -hmm. Do they get stronger as you get deeper into the trees? Well, not necessarily. So I think it, it's just more that they're more specialized tools the deeper you go into them. You, you, I would say some okay. of the uh, the skills that you have buried deep in the tree that we almost come, call 
uh, ultimates, they're they're not just stronger on the baseline. It's not like if you have attack there, it just deals more damage, but it has the potential to be way stronger. It kind of requires you to have a knowledge of the game. I think the the skill that we show in the uh, in the dev diary is called barraging, which essentially lets you uh, allows you to shoot multiple times uh, if you end up killing some characters, and that means that you kind of need to plan out. Okay, if I kill this character, then I can shoot again, and you have the chain reaction. So on its own, it's not just that it's a power peak, but it puts you up for like specialization, and the ultimate is always combined really well with the with the like passive and actives that you put points into previous in the tree. Okay, so um, uh, ultimate sound kind of cool. So each of the mm -hmm. trees, I guess each of the subclasses have their own kind of ultimate skill at the very bottom of them. So if you get deep in enough, you can unlock that last skill. Uh, what are some examples? You have one example of the barrage, right? That's that's mm -hmm. the ultimate for one for the marksman tree. I'm guessing. Um, what's another example of an ultimate from another tree? Uh, another one, which we actually uh, worked on a bit today, with uh, with this modification that I really really like, is called Shield Wall. Uh, and we talked about okay. shields previously on uh, how they like restore their their health pool every round, right, right, right. To kind of reflect your stamina. And we came up with this idea that sometimes you just really want a super big shield. Like you find yourself in a situation, it's not enough that you're just going to regain some stamina to take one hit. So what if you could remove the status effect that allows you to uh, reach it every round, but then like increase your shield strength total by like 300%, then suddenly you will go from having like eight shield strength, which is enough to take one or two hits of damage to go to six hits of damage, like 24 shield strength or something like that. Oh, but then wow. you won't ever reach it again. So then it's like a one-time use in this fight and you're just ready to soak up all the damage, but once it's depleted, it's depleted. So that kind of changes the the nature of how you can suddenly use that shield and sometimes it might be worth it sometimes it, it's not like it all comes down to how you choose to to be tactical about it in, in that combat scenario right okay kind of interesting I, I think that um uh i always uh i i'm a very like a uh, protective kind of player so i always mm -hmm. used the uh the, the 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 shielded characters to kind of carry the the front lines while i was safely like moving my other units around i'm not i'm not super like YOLO go out there and just try to like attack and see uh -huh. and hope, hope to God everything works out. Um, so I think those kind of those kind of skills are really cool to just be like very defensive for a minute mm. and be able to know that you're going to be safe. And that allows you kind of maybe push forward a little bit more or, or do something a little bit riskier for a turn or two because you know you can soak it up. That's kind of cool. Um, exactly. I mean, so uh, another example I could do really quick is like in the skill tree right next to the to the the veteran skill tree for the heavy with that shield wall skill I just mentioned. You have like a skill called Bull Rush. It was literally just you taking your mm. shield up and running a bunch of characters down in a straight line. It might even be allies or your own characters. And that's just like, it's the same class using a shield in both situations, but they're very different from each other. And therefore, yeah, and fitting two different of, fantasies. Yeah, and two different play styles, right? Like the, the, yeah. the trying to get like enemies in a line and kind of position yourself versus uh, being in a very protective stance and making sure that you're kind of at that front line versus trying to do damage. So uh, mm -hmm. definitely makes sense. So how how um uh how deep can you go in each of these trees? It's one of those things where maybe you're only gonna get one ultimate, or um, like how, how with, with twenty levels it's kind of hard maybe to perceive that how how far you can go into them. So what's kind of the distribution of skills when it comes to like putting your points into what you get to be able to get access to? Well, you gain twenty skill points as you mentioned, and then it requires seven skill points spent in a tree before you can actually acquire the. The bottom row meaning you be able to acquire two bottom rows if you like just focus on on getting deep into those trees um you won't be able to get ultimates in, in all three trees and then what becomes an interesting choice there is you also have um multiple skills where you could spend multiple points into them so for the life right, class right, for right. example you have a attack in one of in i believe the assassin subclass which deals 50%, like to begin with, it deals 50% extra damage within the two first rounds of the game. So that one encourages you to be very aggressive right, right off the, the bat of, of combat. Um, but then if you spend another point into that now, it will deal 100% increased damage. So you gain like nothing new there, it's just like uh, like buff to that number, uh, making it by far like better than it was previously, right? Yeah, I, I think that's a, a good uh, thing to clarify, and uh, it's that the you know there's opportunities for you to go um, either deep or wide, I guess, on mm -hmm. how you decide to distribute your skill points. I find it a, a very um, uh, difficult choice for myself personally because I find like the um, improvements when you put multiple points into one skill, the ones that allow that, can be very powerful, yeah. and they can they can make 
certain um, active skills or certain circumstantial um, uh, tactical situations um, uh, a lot more, it gives you a lot more flexibility in a sense that you can like deal with a particular thing a certain way. But going wide is kind of cool too because there's some really valuable skills yeah. in like the second row down on each of the different trees and getting that much utility can also be really powerful. So I, I've sat there many times in playthroughs and just like stared at the tree. The one that I actually uh, always um, like to grab personally is there's a... Um, there's a skill, I don't remember the name of it, but it's it's in the um in a uh, um uh, Bestia's tree because he has a dodge skill where it takes yeah. focus to dodge. Right, right, right. You know what I'm talking about. And um, you can update that. Well, you can put I think two points into it to the point where it has a a, a chance to not consume the dodge um, yeah. buff when you successfully dodge. And mm -hmm. man, that thing can be a I mean it's a little bit of a dice roll, but it can be a lot of fun. Like I've been in circumstances yeah. where it's like. Bestia is just like, whoo, whoo, like, like doing like, yeah. like, like the, the Matrix like bullet dodge thing where everyone's attacking him and you just miss, and you're like, holy crap, man! Like, who needs a shield when you can just like not get hit? Um, mm. I love that. And so I, I, but doing that a couple times and improving those skills does kind of close off other deep options in trees. So you're definitely wrestling with those, you know, those utility uh, um, options based on which ones you decide to go through. Yeah, yeah. What you just mentioned was actually what we call like skill upgrades so it's not just when you put more skill like skill points into the same skill but where there's actually like a link between two of the uh skills in the skill tree where you can't unlock the lower one unless you you get the one above essentially there's no reason to make it like change how dodge work if, if you don't already have dodge right so those are like skill, right, 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 skill, fair, skill yeah. upgrades uh, and i believe dodge actually used to be so that first you would spend one point in, in it and you would have 50 percent chance to dodge and then you would spend another which is 100 percent and I feel like you just had to do that, like, and that yeah. it felt very fun. Like, it was much better to do that. You spend one point in dodge, it's a, it's a really good skill, but then you spend another point in it instead of going deeper and, like, going to that end goal of the ultimate, and now suddenly it, it changes how it works almost, like, completely, uh, but with some dice roll in there, uh, a healthy amount. Yeah, I mean, so I, I, I remember the builds where uh, dodge could be 100% and also three, two times in a row, mm. and... I mean, was definitely a little overpowered but it was also kind of fun i think it was the right choice to tune it a little bit but man there was some bills where like beast he could he could he could do some things like he'd be out there the middle of the battlefield no one could hit him and he's just like i'm gonna just kill kill clowns and roll yeah. on like it was pretty fun i mean very class so maybe i'm a bit uh a bit colored there favoring the light class a bit it bit me a bit much it was it was the class that i really wanted to to fantasize and play in viking but it was actually probably the weakest one you could do like a dual wielding axis in, in in viking so i really wanted to take that fantasy of the like the assassin or the berserker or the, the just the, the fighter without any defensive capabilities and and take that to a point in in a melee tactical game where i thought it, it deserved its, its spot well, this kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier a little bit, which is that, um, you know, you, you, you may decide to, an example, level Beastia a certain way with some very, very specific skill depth, but then mm. you also can get a Praetorian that's of the same class and maybe yeah. level him wider. So you can use both of those kind of in tandem to do different things in different circumstances. And that's where that, like, shared XP growth and being able to kind of experiment with different class builds to figure out which things can work can really add a lot to the um even without even getting into weapon skills and equipment you know just yeah. with the character classes alone there's a lot of experimentation and things that you can try with how these different classes can work in different circumstances mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, I really uh... like that. do you have a do you have a favorite so you said uh, the bestia class the the kind of more uh no, stabby like stabby class that's your favorite yeah. okay but, uh, yeah for sure like there's I, I like to, to just like run as far away as possible from the rest of my crew, making sure that, that I have whatever tools I need in my class skill tree, my equipment, my tactical items. Uh, I out and target maybe the enemy leader or something like that, and then just wreak havoc. Okay. Okay. Learning a little bit more about Hans's personality today and what kind of things that he likes to do. That's cool. Yeah. I, I mean, I... With, with the game, like we're going to go into loot and you'll see where I have a lot of my uh, like original experience uh, from games with I like, grew up on Diablo 2 and those have skills trees and uh, right, I've right, always right. been an avid lover of playing a barbarian and that just made me play Boreas and more barbarians so yeah I, I like to smash let's say it, let's say it that way and yeah, wreak havoc 
You know, it's strange. Um, my 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 playing preferences have evolved over time. When I was younger, I 100% always played glass cannon classes. Yeah. Like I was the, the the mage caster class type player. And I found that I now play. I, I really have a lot of fun. I think it's because I was. I'd be a glass cannon, but I'd be very aggressive, and that could be good, but also could get myself into trouble. But then mm -hmm. I started finding, oh, maybe I actually like the tankier classes. I do like to do crazy things, and I should probably be able to survive that stuff. So now I, yeah. I actually like exploring some of the more tank class trees and the, the protective classes, which are you know have their own nuances to them. Yeah, I mean, being defensive also gives you more freedom in that sense, right? Like, you might not be able to, to slice enemies over as easily, but you can do a, like, create a lot of chaos in other ways, and and probably survive to, to see you the next day. Yeah, definitely. Well, let's move on to talk about some equipment stuff. I think all these things work together, and it's it's, yeah. it's easier to talk about them in Hulk. That was where I think some of the different um, confusion elements during the, the, the dev diary came out. So on the equipment side, um, th this is a big... I guess, like, the, the way that equipment works in our game, we've talked about this before, it's a big part of how your power progression works, too, because... But it's not in the way that I think... Um, uh, I mean, there there is some of that traditional power progression, but it's a little bit different in a sense that it's not just like stats getting stronger, where you have yeah. like a sword that does five damage and then a sword that does a hundred damage. Um, it's more about the skills that you get from the different weapons. So, mm -hmm. um, what's the best way to start with this? I think um, uh, maybe it's the best way to start is just to remind everyone how weapon skills work. Yeah, so as we talked about in Deathstream 2, about core combat, we don't have any white attack, as uh, Brad, Bradus uh, likes to call them, or basic attack, as, as I like to call yeah, them. You can't yeah, just, man, like... man, I, played, I played a lot of World of Warcraft back in the day, right? And and some of the older RPGs and white white numbers, white attacks were just one of those things that everyone knew. Yeah, like for me it's an auto attack or a basic attack. And essentially we don't have that in the game. It was then Rome. Uh, no, in an Expeditions Viking, and you would just left click a character, walk over there, and attack them. And to to add more choice and complexity to the game, we decided that you always have to use a skill. And so all weapons come with X amount of skills on them, um, and you essentially have to choose which ones to bring along to combat, and then in combat, which ones to use on your targets. Yeah, and, and I think it's important to, to to clarify that because some people were asking questions like, okay, well, does your basic attack get stronger or whatnot? And it's or, you know, how do these things work? Is there, is there like a, a basic skill that's associated with every sword or a basic skill that's associated with every um, uh, uh, bow and arrow or whatever? And it's not really the way it works. There's unique skills um, mm. for each weapon subclass. There's a large pool of them. And when a weapon is rolled, basically when it's created, just like you have like in a Diablo type game, it's going to mm. get um, certain skills from its pool that it can get. And those are, yeah. uh, there's a number of parameters that impact what type of skill it is and how powerful it is or how many of them there are but it's every weapon has their own set of skills that they're going to get based on how it was rolled and put into the game exactly it was, and it was actually one of the coolest way that we could create differences between games for example i think it's really cool that a sword like a gladius which of course has two broad sides both can be used for slashing and piercing and then you have something like you know, north and african uh, swords that which are more like a cache that you know from egypt which is just a oh, right, play, right. not designed, like historically not designed for stabbing, but designed for slashing. And so we make sure that you can actually find skills on those weapons, which are uh, using any stabbing uh, in like in the case where they are curved enough. And then you have something where like, if it has a slight curve, well then sure you can stab with it, but it will deal less damage with that stab because you should be slashing with it. Yeah, it's a really cool way to add that kind of cultural flavor in there because not just visually, um, but mm. like each of the weapons have their different pools of skills they can pull from, and those pools can be kind of, um, I don't want to say manipulated, but they can be set, set, set in a way that makes sense for the shape and type of that weapon, yeah. even though they can be randomized within their own pool. That's a really cool aspect to add that that depth in, which I, I really like it. And, and also I think it adds um, different excitement to quote-unquote progression, because it's not just leveling up and unlocking new abilities, which you do kind of get from the skill trees, but mm -hmm. as you're progressing, you're going to get, you're going to introduce to new weapons of new weapon types that have new skills available to them that drop. And so it's like, Oh, I've never seen this skill before. Maybe I'm going to yeah. try this. Um, or uh, you know, it, it, it adds a lot of that kind of excitement of discovery as you're going through. Yeah, I think, I think so too. Like it's really nice to get extra damage and be able to deal with the enemies faster, 
but having something where you like your character actually gets a new animation there's maybe some new sounds attached with it there's a new icon oh, yeah. like it, it works in a new way where you can combo it with skills class skills equipment other weapon skills other classes which you haven't thought about for suddenly like it, it just kind of grows uh, the opportunity in the game whenever you find something new and we thought that that was the best way to to keep players really interested in combat not just by making sure the encounters were always fun but making sure that you could always find some thing new to do in them if that's what you wanted to do yeah absolutely and i mean i i, I remember we talked about this i think uh, a couple of dev diaries ago but when, I, when that first idea was pitched i was super nervous i'm like removing basic attacks is a big risk like that's that's mm. something that's not really been done i'm sure it has been done but not done uh, in a way that i really remembered and um it worked out quite well i think it was a really cool idea so let's go into like the way that the, the way that these items are, are are dropped i guess they do have some progressive elements to them and this is i think we were talking a little bit developery stuff in the diary that may have confused some people but there's there's basically like um uh two ways that items are classified i guess um and one of them is tier and one is quality and we talked about yes. this in the diary and it is exposed in the game you do see these two things represented in different UI elements. So um, maybe break down how tier and quality work for us. Yeah. So tier is a certain, like th that's our way of saying this, this item is on a certain power level. Like when, whenever I talked about uh, stat bumps previously in the stream, when you go from having a tier one Gladius to tier two Gladius, this one will deal more damage. Uh, like this is at its core. That's when you, when you start getting better Gladiuses, they will have like a new icon, the name will get updated slightly, and they will get more damage. And then as we talked about weapon skills, they also start like getting more skills on them, more options. Yeah. Uh, not just from the same pool that you were used to with the tier one, but also skills that you haven't seen before. So whenever you get a new tier, that's where like that's the big progression, that's the big bump up uh, with the items. So you're gonna feel the tier progression. That's gonna be one that when you notice yes. it, you're like, oh wow, now I've gotten a tier two of this type. That's really cool. By the way, Rusty Man, uh, great that you're uh, here and uh, super honored that you're a big fan of the Expeditions games. Um, I will grab your question a little bit later uh, during the Q and A session at the end while we're talking about the the, the weapons and equipment stuff. But really glad you're here, and, and I'll make sure to answer that when we get close to the end there. So yeah, I feel like so we have the tier and the big weapon jump, uh, the big jumps. Um, how does quality work then? Quality is to represent like the state of the weapon in the real world. So if I was like, here, Brad, here's a really good sword, and you will look at it and go like, but hence, it's a worn. This one is going to deal less damage, not be as good as a regular sword. Or in, in other terms, like we have four different qualities. We have the worn, regular, good, and pristine. And those are not there directly just to say that pristine will always be better than uh, a regular sword. It will always be better than a worn sword. Worn is kind of an outlier there, which is that that's more that for a thematic thing. Uh, that worn is like slightly worse, even though it might have the weapon skills on them that you want. But as soon as you, your your um, your items go from being regular into being good or pristine, they get start getting a new um, stat type called affixes, and that essentially that's extra random stuff that we put on these items. That means that once you find a new helmet. Um, or like a Centurion helmet, it has always given you some armor, some resistances, maybe uh, a bit of protection against fire. And then now you find a good one for the first time and it gives you extra health. And then you find another good one and that gives you extra poison resistance. And then suddenly, rather than having those base stats that you're used to always seeing on a regular item, the good item and the pristine item gives you more randomization in how these items, they can uh, be rolled essentially. In good items, they always come with one affix, and pristine items always come with two affixes. So that's kind of a layer there. So how do uniques work things? There's also another hidden one that we talked about in the diary, mm -hmm. which is unique. Is that a special one, kind of even better than pristine? Yeah, I mean, in a lot of games, you would see that you have the, the gray item, blue item, purple item, and sure. then the orange unique or legendary item. And we definitely kind of follow that uh, to a certain degree. And we do have unique items. Um, where they stand out here by a lot is that they won't necessarily have better stats on them than a pristine item, and they won't have necessarily better weapon skills on them than a pristine item. That's all up to the to randomization. And what was very important for, for me here was that I didn't want unique items just to be like, you find a unique sword, and now that's just the best sword that you have, and you don't need to worry about the rest of the loop. Because why would we bother with randomizing all this stuff? 
And I think uh, at a later point, maybe in another dev stream, we'll go a bit into crafting because crafting is a is a big part of the game, and it's something that essentially it's the place in the game where you go to get the best items because then you start personalizing them and getting exact stuff that you wanted we will talk about that another time but unique items won't be the best items you find in the game they will have unique stuff on them though they have something specifically called charms which works kind of like we talk about with passive skills they start bending the rules of combat slightly like making it so that a skill with that one kills maybe it also attacks a random character next to you which might be right. good or bad. So, like, they have extra uh, cool depth to them that uh, is like definitely makes them unique. Yeah, what's I think what's uh, um, you know you're getting a little bit of um, uh, inside baseball here, so to speak, because mm -hmm. a lot of these terms that uh, that Hans is throwing out, you probably aren't going to care about that much when it comes to actually playing the game. Like, you're not going to be care about a uh, unique having a charm. You're going to look at the tooltip and see the cool things that it does and go, yeah. okay, that's kind of neat. But when we're developing this stuff, we have to kind of classify and separate things out so that we can figure out how to, you know, create stats that get added or mm. not added to certain things and set up the data structures inside the game. For any of those out there that are modders, they're probably very familiar with this. When you have like your XML sheets that you have to do to go, here are the different things that can be added and how do I... So there's a lot of this stuff that when you're hearing it, you may be like, I don't understand. Why, how do I track like tier yeah. to quality to like this charm thing that I have to add to a fix? Like all of that's... You're just going to see weapons that have different personalities or things that are going to be exciting when you get them, when they drop, and then you'll choose which ones you want. And, it, and the UI does a good job, I think, of um, mm. oh, pardon me, <clears throat> providing some of that help to see, like, which things are really cool and what things kind of stand out as, as special. Like the, like you said, the uniques having a different coloring mm. um, or the tiers having a different labeling so you understand it. Um, it'll, it makes, it's very natural when you're playing. But yeah, hopefully um, you find it interesting to see how we set this stuff up, because I think it's it's kind of interesting to see the thought process that goes into these things um, uh, and when you're building these games. And that's hopefully the, that's part of the point of you guys being here, is to see how we make this stuff. So, yeah. I mean, it was very important for us that you weren't forced as a player to, to look at every stat and compare every item to like its very depth to each other, to choose the very best one in order to get through the game. Like, that's something you might want to do if you're playing on Insane with, like, Iron Man mode and with, like, permadeath on and different stuff like that's why you should really get into the nitty-gritty of the systems and utilize like all your options of well survival uh but if you're yeah, playing yeah, on pc yeah. normal we definitely just want you to be able to take the item with you without having to, to to do math or spend too much time on it put the item on which the game recommends you and at the very least has the skills that you like to use because in the end like that's the most important like you could have however big a shield you want brad but if you don't know how to kill your enemies like game over you, you need to still be tactical in the game and a lot of your power won't even just come from these uh items Man. uh it needs to be that you actually know how to play a tactical game yeah well i remember actually i had this conversation with uh Jonas and i, I don't think it made the cut but um I, i've i've worked on previous games where this came up was a conversation of dual wielding shields <laughs> and i think dual wielding shields is amazing like i want to be a, a shield man you could punch with a shield like especially if you're like carry cruise size arms like you could you could attack and defend at the same time I, I don't know i think it's always that's one of my fun fantasies like dual wielding a shield i, I love it um, yeah we, we have a lot of fun stuff in them, but i think that's that's kind of where we've cut the the line yeah. i have to be like somewhat realistic with the game yeah, like, we're a historical game it reminds me of like the borderlands guns that shoot guns thing um <laughs> I, I, I love that in borderlands where you could like reload a gun and throw it and it explodes like a grenade and then you pull it back out again like that stuff is just fun um, but you're yeah. right. It's it's there is we, we we have a we are rooted in a little bit of reality, and I don't think many people dual wielded shields back in the Roman days. So fair enough. It's like a one maybe man, though. Uh, maybe I bet you. I would love for someone to find like a historical account of a famous warrior or some kind of part in history that someone that actually like dual wielded shields. Maybe that maybe it's out there. I don't know. Probably not. It sounds dumb. But I, think I mean, maybe in like a gladiatorial fight or something like that. Yeah. yeah who knows. So um, just to kind of summarize how this whole thing works, so we have like these progression moments where, you know, in the beginning of the game, you're probably gonna be getting regular tier one items, maybe a couple worn mm. ones in there. You'll find a good and it'll be super exciting. And as you're going on, you'll start finding like uniques, like our, our pristine, like higher tier ones. And then maybe you'll get the first tier two item in there that's a regular or a worn. It's gonna be super exciting, yes. but it's not. So you're gonna get these kind of like, like seesawing progression elements where you're getting higher quality tier tier lower tier stuff mm. and lower quality next tier up stuff and that's 
how it'll go as you um as you progress through yeah. and hopefully that kind of helps better clarify what was you know uh some people had mentioned it was a little bit confusing in the devs uh, diary um you know as you're kind of these things are back going back and forth and i understand it may sound complicated but i think it's going to create a nice sense of excitement and eagerness when you get that next new thing and you're like oh wow i can't wait to see the cool versions of these yeah. but i'm also wanting to take these right now but maybe i want to use the current really good previous version i had like and now you get the cultural stuff mixed in where maybe i have a new skill that's showing up because i'm now in africa yeah and I'm getting Nasimonis weapons, and they have unique skills, but they're regular. And I'm running around with Greek weapons that are pristine, or what? Like, you have these different like decisions you're making, and that's going to make, I think, the skill layouts that you decide to take in the battle um, fun and allow you to experiment a lot and try to find how you want to play. Yeah, I'm. You're explaining a lot of the choices we wanted you to to have in the game. When you start finding that higher tier, but you have the perfect like lower tier pristine items. Do you go for those new skills and higher damage, or do you keep your like your current sword or spear with the like exact skills you know how it works and you're confident with, and they have their stat, even though you know the other one can deal more damage? Like you have an interesting choice right there, and it might even be that you find something that doesn't have uh, perfect stats and aren't even better stats, but it has a new skill you want to try that out. And yeah, definitely. Uh, I, I don't think it's planned, but I, I definitely think we should mention crafting one of the dev streams because that's that's a lot of the the, the problems uh, or thought process that you could run into as a player who really wants to to deal with these the class designs and e equipment choices where the crafting system kind of fits in as like the the final piece in solving all of these things and, and making the perfect uh, equipment for a soldier yeah i feel like uh i mean crafting is really something that you get introduced to i don't want to say mid game but it's something that com becomes more important a little bit later on in the game yeah. I, I remember like uh, we were doing some early focus tests and some people were only playing like the first three or four hours of the game and they're like man i really want to you know experience crafting it's not there yet and we actually purposely pushed it deeper in the experience because yeah. we want players to experiment with different skills in the beginning we don't want them to fall into that trap of like oh i found what i think is my favorite skill so i'm gonna just play with this and then specialize this and that's all i'm yeah. gonna use um the game is really built so that you get introduced to new mechanics try different things and then as you're starting to grow i guess an appreciation for the the range of things that skills can do then you get introduced and unlock the options to craft more specialized things um because you've gotten that kind of vocabulary of mechanics mm. under your belt um which is i i i think some players may find that a little bit discouraging in the beginning because they really want to get into that crafting system maybe yeah. but i do think it actually works quite well in a sense that we allowed, I mean, I'm not going to name the game, um, but there was a game that I played once that I got like a weapon really early on in the game. This is a long RPG, like 40, 50 hours. And it had an upgrade path that to me just, I loved so much that I ended up only ever using that in weapon the entire game. And I just kept on crafting, upgrading it. And I'm like, yeah, that kind of worked, but it also made the game a little bit boring without even realizing mm. it later on, because that's all I was ever doing. As opposed to like really being encouraged to experiment by the game early on and then opening up after i've had a chance to play with different things and trying to find out what i want to use um i think it's a cool way to do it I, I like it hopefully as people get into it they'll enjoy it too yeah i mean there's nothing wrong with just having that one item want to keep it all the way and the crafting system actually also alleviate for for such a player type which uh, there's nothing wrong with right yeah that yeah, cool well i think we've gotten to the end of the dev stream parts so we're going to go into some questions so people if you have a, a question you want to throw our way about this topic or any others please do um, again, we also have our dev diaries up on our site, uh, community.expeditionseries.com. I always grab questions from the diary, so if you have one, throw it up there. I also fixed a bug with the dev diaries, uh, thanks to someone in our Discord channel. Um, uh, so now you can just scroll down and post directly into the diaries, which will make things a lot easier. Um, we have Discord as well. Uh, we have all of the different social connections, so we'd love for you to get involved and, and, and ask questions and um, hopefully learn more as we go. So we have one question from the diary today that I'm going to answer. Um, we actually kind of answered it through the talk, but I'm going to read it anyway. So I want to make sure that um, this person here, um, her, gets their question read. So Foka asked, the weapon skill system is confusing to read about, but we'll see it in a few days. So maybe it'll be better then. Does a weapon unlock more abilities as it gets better and it randomizes on the weapon's tier abilities? For example, a tier two drop has all tier one abilities and randomizes tier two. Or do they get random abilities through the whole ability tree with each drop, and the better ones have a chance to not 
have uh, some of the more basic abilities. So we talked about this some. It's, it's a little bit more complex than that, but I think it's mm. more fun than that. We don't really have like a progressive set of abilities that are quote unquote stronger. We have different ones that are oriented towards different weapon types or cultures. And as you progress, you'll find some abilities, even from the beginning of the game, still being on later game weapons. Um, but you'll also find new ones that are being introduced as you get introduced to new types of weapons, and then they start mixing and matching in. So it's kind of a, an amalgamation of both of those things. It's not really yeah. sliced either way. There's a bit of a yes and a no to that answer. Essentially, we also always make sure that some of the skills that you were able to get, uh, only able to get on tier 1 I weapons, you also get those on the tier 3 weapons, because you're experienced with that, and they haven't fallen behind it anyways. They're just simpler, but still definitely useful. And then as you progress the weapons, you'll start like having a larger pools of, of skills where they get more and more specialized. And we want to make sure that you don't only get the specialized one, so you're missing something which is like more basic and you're knowledgeable with. So with a very late game weapon, you'll be sure to have something you can always use, but then with a like, few uh, extra special things in there. Awesome. Yep, yep. Uh, we had a few questions from chat that I'm going to go through here in our last five minutes. One of them was from uh, Diva Park, a regular uh, of the stream, and said, uh, so might have missed this, but do XP, does XP have to be distributed um, or does everyone get the same amount? So um, I think it's more a question of like, do you have to distribute XP points amongst people or is it just something you get automatically? It's something you get automatically. Like we determine how much XP you get from uh, completing quests uh, and different pieces of content. And then, based on what we talked on, some characters will gain full XP because they participated in the dangerous stuff in the fighting, uh, and other characters they will just get half the XP. Or there are cases where there's like no fighting involved, and like you just had to bring your companions for they needed to be there for the story, but will get full XP to everyone. It, ha it happens automatically. Progress in the story, and it'll make sure that your characters they stay within the uh, the needed XP range. Awesome. Thank you. Um, all right. Uh, I want to ask answer the question from Rustaman. Uh, he said, he or she, she, sorry, not sure which one. Uh, hey guys, I'm, I'm the craziest fan of your games. Played Vikings, Conquistadors in that order for 150 hours or so. Wow, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate that. Um, I, you're going to love, Rome's even bigger, so I think you're going to have a lot of fun with Rome. Uh, so excited with the news that Rome will have controller support. Um, will it set up for big screen also, you know, large fonts, etc.? So yeah, we are working on controller support. We'll see how far it gets by release. It's it's a it's a stretch goal for us because uh, in our understandings of, of even looking at previous games, most people like predominantly play the game with mouse keyboard. Um, but we we are putting effort into controller, and we're going to see um, how far we can get that by the time that um, the game releases. Um, for big screen, I don't think we're doing anything specific for big screen. But in my experience, big screen should just work. As far as fonts and, and whatnot are concerned, there will be some options to change UI elements and whatnot, so that'll be in there a little bit. But um, that's a good thing for us to remember about and be, be we're, I mean, maybe we, we need to discuss big screen a little bit. I, I, I've never really done any custom work on big screen, so maybe that's something if a lot of people actually play these games in big screen, we can take a look at. Um, a question by, and this is one for you, Hans. I actually don't know the answer to this. Uh, so Bombo Lee asks, sorry to be that guy. Yeah, thanks, Bombo Lee. No, it's fine. Uh, but I'm curious to know how much historical research went into skill and game and gearing progression and crafting. Did this stuff actually matter tactically at the time? I'm guessing he's kind of wondering the line between how much of it is just stuff that's cool for the game and how much of it we kind of pulled inspiration from uh, historical research. I mean, the the core focus definitely in like in the gameplay has been that it, it keeps on being fun. Like if you look into story, then the the like the Gallic warriors they were definitely less fit for war than the Roman soldiers were. And so once you start finding like tier three Gallic items, they will probably with a good chance be better than tier two Roman items. And that's just because we need the game to progress in that stuff. So that's very gamey. But then at the same time, you know that Rome got a lot of that power from their equipment, from how they trained their soldiers and from their shields like especially. So there's a lot of items and considerations in like what should be the strongest items or in which way should be the strongest items. You might have some Egyptian shields, um, where it's like we're designed based on historical uh, finds that Arcus he uh, he looked into with a lot of the character design that are very offensive. They're not as big as the Scutum, not as defensive. And then you have the Scutum, which just has a, a lot of defensive capabilities. Uh, Roman armor, which is just like flat out better, but probably also more expensive to craft. 
Like we, we definitely made some considerations that were all needed to make this feel like it fit in the world and fit in the game. But um, I was probably one of the, the like developers on the game who wasn't scared to kind of go a bit away from the historical to make sure that it's a fun game. That that was definitely yeah, the most important to me. Yeah, I mean, I think I think the it, it's a game first and foremost. So mm -hmm. there's a lot that's done in the skill design uh, to make the turn-based combat exciting and fun, and that's very yeah. gamey, right? Like, I mean, obviously. But real battles don't take place in turns. Um, exactly. uh, so you have to be a little bit fantasy there. But um, I don't want to... I mean, Hans is, is downplaying a little bit, and I appreciate that. The team did a crap ton of research. I mean, the, I could I could oh. show you... I'm not, I'm not going to, but we have <laughs> folders upon folders of hundreds of real images of actual antique weapons um, from all these different cultures, from the, the Gaul era, Nasomonis, Egyptian, Roman... Um, weapons, armors. We actually have some unique items that we were talking about before that are named, um, and uh, these are named by historical items that were um, in these times that have some documentation about them. Mm -hmm. And if I remember correctly from, from Jonas, we even tried to pull um, some of the facts about these items into maybe even their functional usages yes. or whatnot, where it's like, okay, this was a dagger that had this lore about it historically, so when you if you happen to find this thing, some of its functions are based on some of that lore. So there's a lot of um, historical tidbits that are sprinkled all throughout the mm. game um, that is supported by a tremendous amount of research. So yes, it is not going to be history first because it's a game first and we want to make sure it's fun and progression is exciting and you don't get bored and all that stuff is going to be in there. Um, uh, so that's that's where the rule set comes from. But there's a lot of historical um uh, elements sprinkled throughout and the amount of research was pretty was pretty massive so i think yeah. i think as a player you're going to enjoy both of those balances i think it's 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 um you know we're not don't don't get us wrong we're not making a history game we're making a historically inspired game um it's it, it, if that helps to a better frame it. i think we've mentioned that before in the other dev mm. streams you know it's it's a game that is informed by history to bring a world to life um but it is a game and a, and a fun yeah. story the characters are going to be informed like like uh, Kato and, and it has things about him that we pulled directly from the history books and from the things, so to speak. But he also plays a role in the story and he's going to play that role and we take some liberties there. So hopefully that um, adds that perspective in for you. Yeah, I mean, there's a, a lot of history in there, like far more than sometimes that I actually thought, like especially the writers and the art team did a lot of stuff and then interpretation yeah. whenever needed. And th the same thing comes down to me. I think I had to do more interpretation than others because there was the, yeah. like I'm, I'm doing the, the game rules right. But then there's also a lot of stuff where like I can almost take it one to one and put history into the game, and that also yeah. feels really great. Exactly, uh, Bumbley. I hope you uh, uh, stick around and hang out with us as we continue these dev diaries and dev streams. I'd love to hear how you feel about it when you actually have a chance to play the game in a little while. Um, you know, I, I you know obviously we're doing what we can uh, <clears throat> to bring that to life, but. When you have a chance to play the game, you know, you'll be able to come in here and tell us, oh, you did it good, or no, I don't like it. I mean, I, I, I hope you join us and, and, and give us that feedback. So um, that about does it for the stream. I want to mention one thing that I didn't mention earlier on. I am actually wearing the other Roman shirt this stream. The last time I had the black one on uh, with uh, Jonas, but now I have the other one. It has, like, the cool Expeditions mm -hmm. Rome logo on the back. So you've seen both of the cool swag shirts that we got um for the team so uh hopefully that's a, a neat thing i i didn't want everyone to just be like what is that random logo on brad's shirt today it's uh it's rome i'm wearing the games uh game stuff you have a favorite uh, one. thank you so much for uh for joining us today you're welcome like hi, like thank you for having me this is uh, really fun to the game too i've been playing around with a lot of these designs for for so long that i almost can't wait to to share them with everyone of course i'm looking most forward to everyone playing the game but we're, we're getting closer and just having people ask All questions right. Come and listen in is perfect. Yep. Uh, we'll see you guys in about three weeks um, for our next Dev Diary and stream. Um, uh, again, plug into us on our different social channels so you can see the content releasing. And um, we thank you very much for joining us today. We hope you have a good one. Take care, everybody. Thank you very much. Cheers. See you.